because you know the person said that, who founded it and got put it together, someone called Lord Weinstock, and he's very very successful. And then he retired, and then they decided to employ somebody else, and he completely changed the direction of GEC and invested all the money in something else and sold off all the existing things, and he made a terrible catastrophic mistake, and the business basically went out of business. And you know, thousands of people lost their jobs, thousands of people had, well, millions of people had shares in it, and again, lost their. Um, and Lord Weinstock himself, because most of his, his wealth was tied up in shares in this company as he founded it, he was heartbroken, you know, what happened. And so, you know, he gets, so that's why at that kind of level, you want to find the best people, and sometimes you need to pay a lot of money to attract those kind of people to that kind of level of um, responsibility um, but there's not the sort of thing that anybody can do so that's one of the reasons I would say why you, one, when one thinks it's fair they should be paid so much is another question um, but some of them you know just, you know, one can think it's fair or unfair but I don't understand why it is the way it is and often it's because of the decisions that they have to make and so is it easy to make decisions? who here likes making decisions? Depends who it concerns. Sorry? Depends who it concerns. Okay, who concerns? If it's just what I want to have for dinner tonight, then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That can be fine. Right. It's not really good. And then supposing you had to, <coughs> supposing one day you just happened to become the head of a large, of, a, of an army, let's say, in a battle, and you had to decide how to deploy the troops, would you like to do that? <laughs> no, why not? And because people's lives are at risk, right? I, which, whether I send a battalion A or B here or there, uh -huh. it depends on the lives of the battalion A or B. Yeah, somebody has to make those decisions. What kind of person do you want to be in that kind of role, making those kind of decisions? Someone who is knowledgeable and
So there's a constant stream of information and directions that are coming in from above, from the Ministry of Education, Department of Education, or whatever. Constant stream of you know badly behaved kids coming in. And one thing is, <laughs> and you have to make decisions. Yeah? Yes. And you have to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make good decisions, what happens? The whole thing collapses. You know, people get really upset. They feel that's not fair. You made a bad decision there, and this, that, and the other. And you get angry parents coming round. And then you get the offset coming round, and even more stress. And you know, that's, even though people who are head teachers get paid a lot more money, a lot of people don't want the job because they realise I, I don't have the capacity to be able to keep my cool and to make good decisions in this kind of situation. Because a lot of it, leadership is about decision making, or managing is about decision making. You know, when you're a captain on, on a ship, for example, and a storm comes along, you have to make very quick decisions what to do. And you have to know what to do. So you have to have had years and years and years and years of experience. So you don't think, oh, well, this is uh, some bad weather coming up. I'm going to go and Google it and see what I have to do. You don't have time. Or I'm going to go get a book off the shelf. Yes, you don't have time. All that information, all that knowledge, all that experience has to be stored within you. And it has to be readily accessible. So you can make very simple, very clear, and good decisions in a very short space of time. That makes sense? Yeah. And so that's why you can find people like that, you get paid, they get paid a lot more. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, of the responsibility of making decisions. And if they make a bad decision, how do you think they feel? Frustrated. Right? Well, more frustrated. Often they feel incredibly guilty. Exactly. They have to live with the fact that, oh, I made a terrible decision and because of the bad decision I made, it wasn't just me who suffered. Yeah, the whole of my crew shaft suffered, or and maybe the passengers as well. Mm. Sometimes people can't live with themselves afterwards, and you know, sometimes you come across people who kill themselves because they can't live with the uh, you know the decision that they made. Mm. So that's why decision making is very important. Mm. One of the most important roles or things that a leader has to be able to do is to make decisions. And sometimes people think, oh, I wish somebody else would make the decision for me. You ever felt like that? Yeah. Why do I have to choose? Why can't someone else tell me what the best thing to do is? Yeah, and that's the difference between, in that sense, a follower and a leader. A leader is someone who's willing to make those different decisions, the hard choices, and live with the consequences of those decisions. For a lot of people feel, it's too difficult, I wish someone else would decide for me. I wish somebody else would you know, organize everything for me so I don't have to make all these choices myself. Yeah. So which kind of, you know, I mean, so, so this attitude one has also leads to certain kinds of social systems. Mm -hmm. What kind of social system comes about when one wants other people to make decisions for one? A like communist system, no. Sorry? A like communist system. Well, absolutely, a communism, yeah. Yeah, the communism, yeah. So that the Russians got some like Putin and you know, like a strong guy makes all the decisions for them right and then. Right. So Putin's not exactly a communist, but anyway, communism. Where you have the state makes all the decisions from yes. cradle to grave. You don't have to think about, you know, where to send your children to school. You don't have to think about applying for a job. You don't have to think about this or that or the other, because there's someone who makes all those decisions for you. So I remember where I lived in Russia for seven years, and I remember the first time I went. Well, not the first time anyway. When I moved there in 1992, I remember going to the university just to have a look. Went there with a friend. And I remember when I graduated from university, on the notice board in my department, there was a list of all the names and all the degrees that people got, you know, whether they got a first class or T1 or T2 or whatever. And so, you know, I went on to the Moscow State University, and again, on the notice board, there was a list of all the candidates and all the degrees they got. I thought that was interesting. Then I said, well, what's that other list over there? And the person said, well, that's a list of where they're going to work. So after you graduated, then some bureaucrat somewhere decided where you were going to work. And so if you're an engineer, they would look and they would say, oh, we need an engineer in this town. And so you are allocated to a particular job. You couldn't you know, search for a job with a cell. You couldn't think, well, I would like to work in this town, or I'd like to work in this particular kind of job. Or actually, even though I study engineering, I'd actually like to do something completely different. And in communism, Everyone who graduates from university is guaranteed a job 
The only thing they had to do was surrender the freedom to be able to choose where they wanted to work or what it was that they wanted to do. And so all these things were allocated. So they didn't have to make choices, they didn't have to worry about things, it was all decided for them. Um, and lots of things were like that. Housing was all like that. Everything was like that. Um, and it's, you know, it's a tempting you know, to want that kind of society. Um, what kind of you know, free market, a free society is one where actually you have to make the choices, you have to make decisions, and you have to live with the consequences of those decisions, whether they're good or bad. Are you recording this? Just a tiny camera. <laughs>
and they left and the whole fall collapsed and afterwards they went into it and they found out why. But intuitively, you know, he wasn't standing there analysing the situation and figuring it all out. Just intuitively, the sort of subconscious was working there and again, making this decision. And so again, it's very important then as a leader to be open to that side of oneself, to be able to analyse things critically and intellectually, but also to be in touch with a deeper kind of unconscious aspect, which is often not rationalisable, but somehow you sense actually this is the right thing to do and I have to do it now. Have you read the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell? Yes. Yeah, he talks about those that's snap right. decisions. Yeah, snap decisions. Yeah. I think that's probably where we've got the example from actually. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was as a fireman, yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah. But they say that the conscious mind can hold seven pieces of information uh -huh. at a time. So it seems with you know with this capacity it's quite limited actually. Very limited. So yeah. imagine if you are yeah. you know a head of an industry, what decision can you make? You sure. know, if you seven holding yeah, seven pieces sure. of information. It can never be enough. Limited to seven. Yeah. The conscious mind, yeah. That's what they get. It's not a lot, is it? No. Yeah. But then the unconscious mind that is filled with all kinds of experience and all that stuff is there. And it you know, and that's what it's all stored there, so you've got zillions of other bits of information that, based upon experience and all the books you've read, and this, that and the other, and that sort of comes to bear as well. That's sort of, in that sense, intuition is not, um, I guess an intuition in that sense needs to be educated, really. It's not just, you know, oh, well, I've got good intuition, but actually one has good intuition because of a lot of thought and experience and reading and, of using it in the has gone into it in the past, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, that's what one's drawing on, that sort of unconscious reservoir of experience and, mm -hmm. and study and everything else. Would you say that people who practice a lot are lucky more often? Yes. Well, that's what I say, to create your own luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it also seems that the, the bravest decision you make with better the results. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been my experience in my life. Mm -hmm. The bravest that be, the better results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Well, it is, it is, isn't it? The more you risk, the mm -hmm. more you stand to gain. That's the same thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. The more you're ready to well, it's like gambling, it's like risk or sacrifice. Yeah, yeah you're, not prepared to take, you're not prepared to take a risk then. Yeah. Nothing ventured, nothing, nothing gained. gained really. That's right. And so leaders often have to stick their necks out. Mm -hmm make these kind of incredibly risky decisions. Mm. And usually face a lot of criticism when they do that. That's right. Yeah. Big time. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, that's right. Everybody says you're an idiot. What are you doing that for? <laughs> and in that sense you need the courage of your convictions. Yeah. Mm. But you know, that's what helps with the intuitive aspect because you could not. It's somehow a decision which is coming from the depth of your being as opposed to just a little intellectual pros and cons kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's something much deeper. Well, all these elements uh, make some very important thing, which it is a personality. Sorry, what you say? All these elements uh, yes. on top make some very important thing, which it is the personality of the leader. Yeah, the personality and character as well. Yeah. <coughs> personality, is, everyone has different personalities. The character is <coughs> you know, about making a decision and sticking to it and living with the consequences of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's have a look at... Um, so I, this I showed you last week. So a good leader then, you know, this, it's not, this is like a decision-making continu continuum. And so a good leader is not someone who just does it one way or just does it the other way, but has this sort of flexibility. So we looked at this last week, I'll just go through it again. So the far left end there, the manager makes decisions and then announces it. So in that sense, the manager makes the decision and everyone has to carry it out. And then the far right-hand side, the manager permits his subordinates to function and to, you know, presents them with a problem and says, you know, let's solve this problem together and you can come up with a solution to this problem. So in that sense, the manager is not saying, is not making a decision, He's actually involving all the people working with him in the decision-making process. So it's not that one is good and one is bad. It's just that a flexible manager or leader is 
is able to realize that a different process is appropriate at different times. If, for example, the one end, or the far left end, if they're your, you know, as I said, you're in charge of um, you know, a fire engine, you're the captain of the fire team, sometimes you just have to make incredible snap decisions. You can't sit around and say, well, boys, men, what do you think? What should we do for this fire? You know, should we stay in here and fight it a bit longer or should we go, you know, <laughs> can't do that. So a lot of it depends upon the situation, how much time there is, how, many, how much knowledge and skill the people <coughs> you're working with have, all these different constraints. So what are the advantages of the far left hand side? What are the, what are the advantages of just a leader? or manager who just makes all the decisions himself and issues them? Well, there is not, there isn't uh, that much uh, discussion about the issue to be solved. Right. So whatever the leader decides, so people will follow. Okay, so when is it good to, to be like that? Like in the example you just gave in terms of the fire fire. In a military situation. Emergency. Okay, one situation may be emergency is a shortage of time, okay? When else might a manager do that or a leader do that? When there's a battle going on in the military situation. Well, again, that's a um, shortage of time. You can't mm -hmm. actually, you know, it's, it's an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just can't agree and it's just nobody can come to a, a consensus. And so sometimes they just need somebody with the confidence of their vision to say, okay, just trust me and we'll do it this way. Sort of also direction of group. Especially big groups. Is that a good thing to do if you have time? No, I mean if they if they can't if they just can't agree and then right. you give them, them a discussion but mm -hmm. there's just different factions and they just can't agree. And sometimes they need a confident leader to say, let's do it this way. Um, yeah, sometimes, but does that really solve the problem? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes, 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 sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> yeah, rather than not making a decision, yeah. Uh, okay. Another time is when, when the leader or manager actually really knows best and the people who are under him or with him don't have much experience or don't have the knowledge or skills, in which case they don't have much to contribute in that situation. He realizes I'm much more experienced, they're all very inexperienced. So in this situation, there's no point in asking them. Actually, I need to teach them in that sense and I need to train them. And in that sense, I'm the master, they're the apprentices. Yeah. That kind of situation. So, at this, and then at the far end there, when, when, is, when would it be good to do that, use that kind of approach? What do you need in order to do the, the approach on the far right? People who are very capable and able to do things without having to be supervised all the time. Right. Yes. So people who can take initiative, who have some kind of either education or training or knowledge or abilities mm -hmm. where they can actually be successful mm -hmm. um, in a supported environment, but not necessarily, you know, yes. pushed so, from above. Right, so as a manager you realise that all the people working with you, they're all, they all have experience, they're all skilled, they're all qualified, they're all very capable, they're all very motivated, and you realise that actually they may have better ideas than you have. Mm -hmm. And so you just give them a lot of the freedom and a lot of responsibility, so these are the kind of limits and you, know, you work within this kind of framework. And of course you need time as well. So what are the advantages of doing it like that? <coughs> Do people feel empowered? People feel empowered, yes. Anything else? More satisfied. More satisfied. They take ownership of the situation. Yeah, it's a lot more satisfying. People feel ownership. They feel, you know, I, I can have a say in this. You know, so in that sense, they feel much more committed to it. Mm. And often you get a much better plan, actually. Mm. You know, if there's just the far left end, you know, there's a, it's, the whole plan relies upon one person's knowledge and experience, which is, in that sense, limited. Even if the person's very experienced, but as far right hand end, if you have a lot of people who've got a lot of experience and knowledge, and they pool that knowledge and experience together, 
you can come up with a much better plan than any single person could have had. Yeah. In that sense, you're drawing upon everybody's skills and abilities and you know, perspectives, and you can develop a much better plan than if it's just the manager coming up with his plan. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has lots of different advantages. One, a better plan. Everybody's more involved. People feel like, actually, I can fulfill my potential. I could use my abilities, my knowledge, my skills in this situation. You know, people who are, uh, respect me, and you know, you feel it's a much more satisfying kind of job, much more satisfying kind of job to work with. In a sense, the one on the left would be appropriate in a situation where people are in a position of being very new or trainees mm. or not very experienced mm. or very young or something where there's not a lot of. You know. Right. Have you been in that situation yourself? Yeah. And how did it go? Um, I think the problem was in that job that I had a, when I was a trainee at that time, um, there wasn't enough interaction with the manager. Mm -hmm. He did meet with us occasionally, one by one or as a group, but I think the general consensus of opinion amongst us was a mm lot of dissatisfaction that we wanted to give a lot more feedback mm. to that manager mm. and he just wasn't there to listen to the feedback mm. and when he did he didn't do anything about it mm. so it was a very frustrating experience mm. but I think we followed the guidelines mm. that wasn't so much the problem mm. it was the the amount of feedback, the dynamic within that particular company wasn't mm. dynamic enough. Sure. So if it had have been, I think it would have been quite successful. Yeah, mm. yeah so it's a sort of cultural thing sometimes, isn't it? Mm. You just feel the whole company is not like that. Yeah. And you feel kind of frustrated and you feel, well, maybe I'll go somewhere else. I think it has a lot to do with respect as well, because yeah. if you meet somebody in the corridor, if they just ignore you, mm and walk straight past you, even if they're your manager or the mm. manager of the manager, mm. it would be very m much more meaningful if they say hello or good sure. morning. Mm. Whereas if they just ignore you, mm. I think it, it is a bit soul destroying because you feel like you don't exist, you have no meaning, no purpose in life mm. and you're just a number. Mm. So. Has anybody been on a good experience at the far left end, either as a manager or as a follow our apprentice. Oh, okay. The question of uh, adopting. Mm. 
It's a question of adapting. Yeah, adapting. Being yeah. very adaptable, flexible. Mm. Yeah. Um, have you ever watched Forty Towers? How not to run a hotel? All these sorts of things are quite funny. Okay, so I had a couple of things here. This isn't. Okay, it's a little exercise here, it's the one which I just put on this PowerPoint, the other ones I want to print out, but we can try this. This is a little exercise for testing your ability to be able to solve problems. And it's the kind of thing that often managers have to do. They've got all these bits of information and they have to try and you know, work out what's really going on here and to be able to make a decision. So, I think it's not easy enough. And there's uh, some pens. And uh, can you read it? There's yes, five taxi drivers being summoned to pick up five fares at a London club. On arrival, they find that passengers are slightly intoxicated, have been drinking too much. Each man has a different first and last name, a different profession, a different destination, and each man's wife has a different first name. And able to determine who's wife, who's who, and who's going where, taxi drivers ask you to find out. Who is the baker? What is Bert's last name? Who is going to Baker Street? Barker Street. Who is going to Barker Street? So this is the information you've got. So you have to answer these four questions. Three questions. Who is the baker? What is Bert's last name? And who is going to Barker Street? Do you want to do this individually or as a team of two? <coughs> Who's going to Barker Street? Hmm? Okay, individual, let's see who's the best. Okay, alright. Let's we'll see how long it takes you to work it out. <coughs> I don't know the answer myself, so we'll work it out. <laughs> I didn't bring the answer book. <laughs>
pieces of information and they have to be able to analyze them and to solve these kind of problems. Or if you're on a battlefield, you just have to be able to process all this kind of random information very, very quickly. And not everyone can do it, I can't do it. <laughs> My brain's too old now. <laughs> but you know, you could, you could hear the process and you can see you have to, from this clue, this clue, this clue, you work up that. So you have to be able to hold these clues in your head and form the pattern. And it's not easy to do that, not very many people can do that. <coughs> uh, so I remember the book, it said the average time of solving it was about 30 minutes. If you solve it in 15, you're extremely good. So, you know, that's, these are the kind of um, yeah, puzzles that people have to solve when they're making decisions. And that's why people get paid, some people get paid a huge amount of money, because they can solve these kind of problems. You know, going back to the brain surgeon thing, how do you get to this particular part of the brain? Well, you do this and this and this, and you've got all these pieces of information you have to hold together, and you have to work out a solution to the problem. And not everyone can do that. And there are very few people that can do that, and that's why some businesses <coughs> pay lots of money to try and attract these kind of people to their business. Um, in the city of London, they call it talent. Was uh, if you look at the kind of performance of how do you wonder how talented are they really? <laughs> but that's just the way it works, you know. There aren't very many people who can do this kind of thing, and these are the kind of decisions that uh, you know, people at the top of their game have to make to solve problems. And, you know, you know. Anyway, so as I said, what's the solution there? Maybe we want a tea and coffee. Yes, for sure. I think we all deserve some tea and coffee. <laughs> 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 The individual <coughs> taxi drivers, I mean, after all, okay, I would be able to follow because they only need to take a couple of people. Well, they ended up asking this bystander to do it for them because they couldn't work it out. Well, I'll see And you're the bystander that these taxi drivers said, you know, we've got all these drunk drunks in our taxis, we don't know where to take them, can you work out this problem for us, please? I'll see so I didn't need. Alright, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next um, time, please bring the answer sheet. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I was trying to get everything done, I just couldn't. Yeah, we, we'd like to start another three-part series for next Monday, yeah. going until the 21st. Yeah, going until what? To the 21st. Of April. Yeah, yes, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have the final topic. Yes. Okay. Um, but that's kind of good. But we'll continue from next Monday. So, how do you want to decide on the topic? Do you want to be um, we can. Oh, yeah. We can take it right here, actually. Yeah. I can't remember what the options were now. But I have. I, um, I, um, I, I like your sort of multi part lecture on either. Is that more Jewish? Is that compact? And there's uh, okay. it's something that most people, including myself, until I heard it once. I, I just didn't know anything about that. What are the options for you? One is on Judaism and one is on Islam. It's a lecture on Judaism, like, or a series on Judaism, a series on Islam, a series on science and religion. Another one on so science and religion together. Or is that two separate ones? No, looking at science and religion, the relationship between science and religion. Right, so that's one series. These are some of the topics that we are. Okay, so William has proposed um, some three part series to talk on uh, a critique of Marxism, socialism, and other ideologies, uh, science and religion, another one, current world affairs and God's providence. Um, leadership development, which we've done, and um, we've learned how to study the Bible, um, and then historical um, analysis, history and teachings of Judaism, of Islam, of Christianity. So that would be nice to have maybe those um, series back to back. Um, and there's also ones on applied unification thought, uh, basically, a principal look at economics political economy, education, philosophy, evolution. So it might be good to clump certain um, <coughs> groups of talks together. Oh, I don't know, we could just alternate them and have a bit of variety. Yeah, oh. sure. What was the one about current world affairs? Current about? world affairs and God's providence. Sounds very interesting. Uh, I had a bit of time to work on that one. I couldn't do that for next week. Mm. Things I can do for next week, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, science, religion. Okay. Um, it's all three 
colleges, Jewish Christian relations. Um, I need a bit of time for that. Okay, but how about how about history of teaching of uh, Islam? Yeah, I'm not sure if I've heard that one before. Yeah. How does that sound? History of teaching of Islam. Is that three parts? Three three lectures on that. Is it? Or is that one part of... One more. I don't know, I'm just asking a question. Is, yes. it, is it three lectures, or is yes. it one lecture of three? No, of yeah. it's a three-part three three different one. Yes, that's what it'll be over three weeks. Yeah. I didn't know you didn't want to have science or religion, I'm interested in that one. I think I would need three weeks, I'm quite Islam illiterate. Oh, Shall we vote? Yeah, maybe we well, can... We're going to vote between. Yeah, between, uh, look at um, Judaism, uh, Islam, or Christianity. Or what? Science or religion. science. Or science religion. religion. Okay. Okay. The one that's sort of prepared. So we've got the other one's just take more time. Okay. Hands up for science and religion. So that's four. Hands all the way up. Wait, wait. One, two, three, four. Okay. Is that one another one at the back? Five. Yeah. Five. Are you, uh, are you voting? Is that, is that a hand? Yes. Yeah. Six, six hands up. Uh, history and teaching of Judaism. History teaching of Islam. One, two, three, One, four, two, three four, five. Another half. Wow. History and teaching of Christianity. <laughs> it's a tie. I think, oh, I think science and religion for next week. Oh, no, 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 it was a tie. Between. Uh, <laughs> no, six is a tie. Strong is taking one. So a tie between Islam and science. Islam and science and religion. Why don't you have a. a a revote. A revote on that. Okay, so between yeah. science and religion and history and teaching of Islam, um, science and religion. So one, two, three, four. Oh, ben, seven, ben, we got one more. Yeah, seven, ben, no, ben. please don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, history and teaching of Islam.